Uh, welcome to today's video. Uh, in today's video, we're going to be talking about Tree Search Dynamic Programming Uniform Cost Search. This is the ninth video in the Learn Machine Learning series. And in today's video, it's going to be a bit longer because we're going to talk about a completely different kind of machine learning. Some of the more higher logic and more complex techniques in machine learning, right? So I think so far we've talked about regression, uh, linear models, classifiers. We talked about uh, linear algebra techniques like dimensionality reduction, uh, PCA. I think last video we talked about uh, K nearest neighbors random forest models. Today we're basically going to take a completely different turn and we're going to jump into what I call tree search or what is known as tree search algorithms. And these algorithms are uh, really cool um, uh, data structures and techniques for basically uh, looking for some out optimal output. So today we're going to discuss the role of tree search, dynamic programming, uniform cost in relation to machine learning. And hopefully you find today's video pretty informative. So once again, this is the ninth video in the series. We're covering something a bit different today. And let's get started. So we'll start with the introduction to search algorithms. And what is a search algorithm? Why is it useful? What are the applications? How is it different from the past machine learning topics we've covered, etc. Um, before I start talking about the content in today's video, just a preliminary note. Uh, many of the slides and materials and graphics are taken from CS221's autumn quarter at Stanford, um, with professors Dorsa Sadig, and so credit to them for the content, and a very, I do appreciate that they put this content online for the public. Let's get started, though. In order to understand the problem of search algorithms and what they're used for, we have to talk about an introductory problem, or I feel like this is the best way to really um, immerse yourself, immerse you guys in this um, process and how to think like a search algorithm. Here's a problem. A farmer wants to get his cabbage, goat, and wolf across a river. He has a boat that only holds two. He cannot leave the cabbage and goat alone or the goat and wolf alone. How many river crossings does he need? So here we go. This is the basic layout or how most search problems can be simplified to. So we have a farmer and he has a goal. He wants to get all of his possessions, a cabbage, some cabbage, a, a goat, and a wolf across a river. He has a boat that can only hold two, and he has two certain constraints that he must satisfy. He cannot leave the cabbage and goat alone or the goat and wolf alone because I mean, the goat will eat the cabbage and the goat will eat the wolf. Sorry, the wolf will eat the goat. So there's some, there are multiple constraints, and there's an end goal. And there's different paths we can take to solve this problem. And so I think for this problem, there's one particular solution. Let's try to, let's try to get there. So the farmer, he cannot leave the cabbage and goat alone or the goat and wolf alone. So that means that first, he would have to take, it looks like he's going to have to take the goat. So he makes one crossing to drop the goat off on the other side of the river, him and the goat first. He crosses back and he finds the cabbage and wolf. And in this time, he takes the cabbage. He makes another crossing, this is the third crossing and he reaches the river, boat the side of the river. He then crosses back by himself, and then he takes the wolf for the last time. So there will be optimally five ways, there will be five river crossings will be needed in order to solve this problem. So there you go. So I want you to think about this and understand how would you have solved this problem? And how is the way you think in these problems really interesting because you're trying to satisfy constraints and achieve some end goal at the same time. And so this is really interesting. Let's analyze this problem. So when you when you probably thought about this problem while I was discussing it, you probably analyzed scenarios in your head. And this is how it works, right? This is an iterative process. You probably tried different uh, possibilities, right? So you probably said, oh, let's just try the wolf going across first. Let's just try the cabbage going across first. You didn't necessarily think of the logic in imme immediately but you probably were just doing trying different ways and see which one works. Well, that's an example of brute force trial and error. And trial and error is when you commit to an action and you observe the consequences. And that's what you probably did in this scenario, right? So you probably just tested different possibilities and said, was it successful or not? And the consequences could have either been, oh, everything's okay, keep moving, or it could have been, oh, this failed because, for example, we maybe we, maybe we left the cabbage and goat together. Right, or maybe we left the golden wolf together. So there, there you have to continue, right? Then you have to restart. But you see, there is basically a process. You try different possibilities, and you observe the action and the consequences, and based on that, you modify your the next possibility you're going to choose. 
So this is what's really interesting because this behavior that even humans do can be expanded to search algorithms. So search algorithms have two premises or two essential components. There's a search problem, right? You need to find what possibilities are possible and how you're going to take them. The actual search algorithm is how we explore those possibilities in an efficient way. So in this case, your brain was thinking, was you're basically doing trial and error, brute force trial and error to try um, what's going to work, right? And based on that, observe the consequences and based on that, modify the next possibility. The ser actual search algorithms is how you tested those possibilities. You actually explored them. So that's the basic layout for any kind of graph or search algorithm problem. So these algorithms are known as uh, search algorithms or tree search algorithms. Um, they're also known as graph algorithms. And what I'm trying to get you guys um, to understand here is that for now, um, today's video is different is because the reason it's different is because we're moving from reflex models, out models where we just get a label as our output, or like some, some class or categories or outputs, some classifier model. We're moving from that to state models. State models are where we get an action, sequence, and output as the output, right? You don't get you don't get like just a label. Like in the example of classifying cats versus dogs, we run a classifier on it with computer vision, we analyze the images, we have do we do feature extraction, blah blah blah, you get the idea, and then we output like whether it was a cat or dog. Let's just say in one case it was a cat. On the other hand, a state model is a higher logic model, right? This is approaching high level intelligence on the scale of machine learning. Because these state models are gonna give us what's known as an action sequence output or action sequence as our output, right? And that action sequence is basically, instead of just telling us what the right output is, it's telling us how do we get to the right output, what actions we have to take to most optimally or most efficiently reach the required or desired output. So there you go, that's where we're moving from. We're moving from those classifiers like K nearest neighbors, uh, K means clustering, um, uh, Bayesian machine learning, to action sequence models. So there you go, or state models. Uh, let me just reiterate. So today's lesson is about moving beyond classifiers. Classifiers are reflex models. They return a single output. You plug in your x and you get a single output, like negative one, one. Um, it's a categorical or continuous output, typically categorical. On the other hand, search algorithms or state models, the ones like we're talking about in the, in the farmer crossing the river example, return an action sequence where you plug in an input and you get a sequence of uh, basically variables or actions on how to best execute and uh, most optimally reach the output. And in search algorithms, what's really interesting is that we have to consider the future actions of the model. It's not really that simple where we can just say, oh, we have features, we're going to learn from our features and classify based on the different features. Instead, with search algorithms, you have to really, it's really much more complex because you have, to, you have to try different ways to reach the optimal output, right? And the goal is to reach the optimal output most efficiently, right? I think these days in programming, it's not about how, whether you do reach the op optimal output. It's about whether how efficiently or how smoothly you reach it, right? So that's what we're going to be considering today. Today we're talking about search algorithms or these state models. And today it's all about the higher logic part of machine learning. We're returning actions instead of just a single output. So there you go. But let's get into tree search. So we're going to start off by talking about tree search, which is really just a name for, I guess, it's kind of like search trees where you have like a, a tree and several nodes and you're trying to find some path based on the edge costs to the final state. So let's talk about tree search. Let's go back and analyze, let's do an analysis of the original problem. So in the original problem, there are always a set of actions and consequences. So an action, for example, could be like, oh, the farmer goes across the river with the goat. That's an action. So I think we can represent this as a farmer arrow right. So Farmer arrow right means farmer by himself across the river. Farmer arrow left means far, far, farmer goes back to the original the original spot. And then all those actions, like they really represent, they can be represented really simply, right? So like I guess farmer FW to the right will be farmer takes wolf and goes to the other side of the river. There you go. So those are the actions we defined are all the possible actions, right? Those are our possibilities. And going back here. Those are our search problem possibilities. And now we want to build a search tree and think about what if we, like, what if it doesn't go right? How do we modify our tree? What if we actually hit a good output? Like, we're getting closer to the optimal output. What do we do? So that's how we build a search tree. 
What are search trees? Search trees are basically layers of, or is a data structure for layers of actions, which each action having a specified cost. And so let's define some terms. There's nodes and edges, okay? Edges are the links between nodes, right? So the edge is a path from one node to another, and the node itself is a spot, right? So I guess in that, in this example with the with the farmer, cabbage, goat, wolf example, your nodes are the two sides of the river, and your possibilities are all your oh, sorry, all your actions can be represented as different edges, different ways to get to the other side of the river, right? So in this case, we're going to define the root of the tree as a starting s start, the leaves or edges of the tree, basically the most bottom nodes as is end, right? That's the final node. Each node will correspond to some possible action, right? The edges are how you move from one action to the next action, and each action least is ideally going to lead to a final state, right? And the cost of the edges is the cost of the path. So let's, let me try to simplify this. So we have each node is an action, right? So we move from one node to another node, we're basically uh, taking actions. The edge is the consequences between those actions. Um, and the cost of each edge is the consequence in relation to the problem, right? And the ideal goal is that each action will lead to some final state where we've completed our search tree. So there you go, that's how it works. We have nodes, we have a root node, all the other leaf nodes, you have edges, and then you're gonna have the end of the tree, which is your final nodes. That's it. So let's talk about a form of basically going to this tree of traversing this tree, that's the technical term. So there's an algorithm known as the backtracking search, right? And a backtracking search is really just an algorithm that brute forces its way to, to basically go across the tree and is able to um, look at all the costs, look at all the edges, look at all the nodes, etc. cetera. Um, on the other words, a backtracking search is an algorithm that tries all paths in, ho in hopes of finding the MCP or more importantly, the minimum cost path. It's a depth first traversal of the tree, and it typically uses a computer science technique known as recursion, right? And so here's the definition of the algorithm in pseudocode. So defining backtracking search with the giving node in the path. If you're at the end of the tree, right, we update that we, we update our MC, MCP, the minimum cost path. And then for each action, we're basically extending path from the last node to the next node, right? And I think it's better to just demonstrate this on this given tree here. Oops, my bad. Yeah, let's just demonstrate this here. We start at the root node 8, and we try to traverse the tree. So we go to 3, then we go to 1, and then we've explored this node, there's nothing else. We go back to 3, we then go to 6, we explore 4, nothing else to explore here. We then go back to 6 and to 7, nothing to explore after 7, and we go all the way back to our root node, and then we go to 10, 14, and 13. So that's kind of how recursive backtracking search works. And so the takeaway I want you to understand here is that you're trying all the possible paths in hopes of finding the minimum cost path, right? And the way that you find the minimum cost path is that you basically analyze the cost of taking one path versus another. You analyze the edge cost. That's the term, right? Edge cost. And the minimum cost path is a path to the optimal output where all the edges and their costs combined is the lowest possible across the entire tree. And therefore, Backtracking search works as a depth first traversal of the tree, and it uses recursion. That's why I want you want. Well, that's what I want you to understand here. So that's tree search. Um, that's basic tree search, right? And I think to understand tree search better, I think we want to understand graphs and uh, search trees a little bit better as well. So let's talk about some key vocabulary in graphs. So graphs are basically structures for representing relationships. Uh, I think we already talked about this. We have graph nodes, the vertices, the actual actions. And we have graph edges, or arcs, where the edges represent the consequences and costs between actions. So for these nodes, there are different uh, terms we can use to define the relationships of nodes. So there's reachable nodes, right? So two nodes are reachable if those nodes are connected, meaning that there's a direct path between both of them. So I think, uh, look at the bottom of the slide, the one on the left, you see where there's two um, separate like little chains. There's A, B, C, then there's D, E. So nodes A and C are reachable. That's an example of two reachable nodes. So a connected uh, node. So connected nodes are basically where 
every vertex is reachable. In other words, every node can be accessed um, across the graph. So an example on the right of the bottom of the slide, you see A, B, C, D. These are all, every vertex is reachable. There's no unreachable vertex from any kind of root, wherever the root is in the graph. There you go, that's connected. And then this is also an example, this one on the bottom right, is also an example of a complete graph or a complete set of nodes where every vertex is a direct edge or direct path or arc to the next, to any other node in the graph. So there you go. That's an example of a connected or complete structure graph. Let's talk about some terms with edges. Uh, a graph is considered cyclic or cycle if a path begins and ends at the same node in terms of its edges. So there you go. That's why we have cyclic graphs. It begins and ends at the same node based on the uh, different edges. There is also acyclic graphs. These are graphs with no cycles. In other words, the graph may start at one node and end at a different node based on all the different edges or arcs or paths that it takes. So that's some important vocabulary that we're going to use throughout today's um, lecture. Here are some graph traversal algorithms. So I think we talked about backtracking search. And backtracking search does complete the job, right? I think in the beginning of this lecture, we talked about how we want to find the solution most smoothly or most efficiently. And to some point, backtracking search does solve half the problem because we do get the minimum cost path, right? That's a good thing. So it does half its job. But the issue is that this is not efficient. Backtracking search will return it, but it's not as efficient as we would want. And I'll explain the what I mean by inefficient, but backtracking search is inefficient in that it doesn't really satisfy the space and time complexity that would be ideal for finding the minimum cost path. So my um, important question for you is, how do we traverse a tree and get the minimum cost path faster compared to backtracking back search, right? Backtracking search does get the minimum cost path, but I believe, and there is, so many different ways to get it faster and traverse the tree. So let's talk about some techniques on how we can traverse the tree faster than backtracking search while also obtaining the minimum cost path. And just to reiterate, before we talk about some of the other algorithms, minimum cost path is just when we're finding the optimal um, endpoint for our graph, the, the last um, node, the minimum cost path is the fastest way to reach, sorry, not the fastest way. The minimum cost path is the way to reach that node with the least possible costs across the entire graph, right? If there is a way to reach the minimum, the minimum, sorry, if there is a way to reach the final node. So that's what the minimum cost path is, right? Across the entire graph, how do we get to that final node with the minimal cost? So my first algorithm for you to understand is depth first search. Depth first search is an algorithm that relies on this assumption of all action costs are zero. Um, I think I haven't talked about action costs yet explicitly, but action costs are very, very similar to the edge costs. So we talked about edge costs as basically being the cost of a path from one node to another. I guess in this case, the action cost is the same thing as the edge cost. It's zero in that if, we, if we're going through a graph, then the cost from one node to another node for, any, for all the nodes in our graph is going to be the same. So in that case, we're not prioritizing any special node because its cost is zero, because we're assuming all costs, because all, because we're assuming that all costs are zero. So even if in reality, one node does have a higher cost, we're not going to prioritize that when we're running this algorithm. And so what comes out of this assumption is this is the idea that we're finding a path to the goal regardless of cost. And that means that cost is not a goal for this, uh, this, for this algorithm. Let's, so the my main idea here is that depth first search is basically a backtracking search and the, the algorithm stops when we reach any end state. So I think a good way to explain this is to basically just go on this, this tree that's right here in front of us. So this is um, a tree with depth, a tree with depth three, and you can see there's nine, seven, three, five, one, two, four. Okay, let's, let's do a depth first search on this tree. Assuming that once again, cost is zero for all action costs. Basically, going from one edge to another edge, the cost will be zero, regardless of the, the real cost in reality. So the way we would do depth first search on this tree, we start our root node, nine, we then go to seven, and then we go to five. We then come back to seven, we then we go to one. We then exit one, go back to seven, go back to nine. 
Then come to three. We'd explore three. And then at three, we're going to go to two, come back to three, then to four. So the idea with depth first search is that this is a very, very similar to backtracking search. But it's just that we stop when we reach any end state. There you go. We just stop and we return back to the, the node on top of us when we reach an end state. This is depth first search. Um, it is, does have advantages and disadvantages, and we'll talk about that. So let's move on to that. So before I want to talk about like the applications of depth first search and all that, I want to talk about the pseudocode and its implementation. So I think the broad idea here is that we visit each edge once and each node at most once. And complexity-wise, um, I'll discuss this in detail uh, later. But for now, I want you to understand that for a graph with n nodes and m edges, DFS, Death First Search, takes O, the big O, n plus n time to run the algorithm. So that's just a little idea of that it's a linear, linear-based uh, time algorithm complexity. So we'll discuss the idea of time complexity and space complex complexity and why they're important later. But I think for now, I just want you to leave you on that note. So here's the pseudocode for running a uh, depth first search. You see that for each node in our in our graph, we're going to mark the node as seen as soon as we visit it one the first time, and then for each of its unvisited neighbors, we we recurse and run the algorithm again. So going back here, it's simply just a backtracking search, recursive backtracking search, and we stop when we reach end state and we return to the node above it. So I think just once again going through this graph nine seven five we would go back to seven. We go and go to one, we then return to seven, return to nine, go to three, go to two, return to three, go to four. That's how depth first search is gonna work. So now let's talk about breadth first search. And I think breadth first, breadth, breadth first search is also pretty useful. And there's a different assumption for breadth first search. In breadth first search, um, our assumption is that all action costs are constant. And it's important to make this distinction. I did not say zero. I said all action costs are constant. And this means that there still is an action cost. It's non-zero. It's non-zero, right? But it's all constant. So there is a cost, but they're all going to be the same cost. So there you go. Some It's the same non-negative number for each edge and each path for each node. And the main idea of breadth first search is that we explore nodes by increasing depth. So let's do an example of breadth first search on this, on this example. So I think in this example, it will be 9, 7, 3, 5, I believe 1, 2, 4. That's breadth first search for this example. So how do we implement breadth first search? So to implement breadth first search, it's a pretty simple process. So actually, it's interesting because it's the same um, time complexity in this case. For a graph with n nodes, for a graph with n nodes and m edges, Breadth first search takes O, big O, n plus n time. And same exact um, procedure as DF, as depth first search for its uh, visit, for how it visits nodes, right? It visits each edge once, and at most, each node once. And here's a pseudocode for uh, breadth first search. So we have a queue. So we run the breadth first search algorithm, and we add a node to the queue. And while the queue is not empty, we're going to dequeue a node, remove it from the back of the queue, and add a node, an unseen node, to the queue, and then run on the next node, and then see it, explore its neighbors. And so, breadth first search is all about this idea of exploring by depth, not by actually like nodes and subtrees. Because in depth first search, I think the name is misleading because depth first search, it's more, it's very similar to backtracking, but it's just a backtracking algorithm where we come back after each end node, right? But in the case of breadth first search, we are exploring nodes by depth. But in terms of depth, I mean by, la by layers, right? So I think the example was on this graph, it was we start by 9, we then explore 7, then we explore 3, right? But in depth first search, we start with 9, 7, same thing, but then we explore 5, not 3. So that's an important distinction to make in the case of breadth first search versus depth first search. And we'll talk about the two in comparison, uh, comparing them and contrasting them next. So let's just uh, do a direct comparison because I think this is the easiest way to understand the two techniques. And so here we go. So breadth first search, we start off with zero in this case, then we move to one. But instead of depth first search, like depth first search in this case will go to three next, right? Because we're moving down the subtree and we're moving down to the leaf nodes, right? But in this case, the breadth first search is going to move by depth. And so since one and two are nodes on the same depth, we have to explore all nodes at that depth before moving on. So then we go from one to two. 
and then we go back to, then we go down to the next layer and so these two um, use uh, different data data structures like I think uh, we already talked about how BFS uses a queue uh, death research DFS uses I believe a recursive data structure and um, a recursive algorithm since it's very similar to backtracking but hopefully this clarifies the difference between DFS and BFS and now let's talk about how, so I think I did mention earlier that we would talk about the, how why time and space complexity is important and I think the issue with these tree search algorithms like breadth first search and depth first search BFS DFS is that even though we do get the linear space complexity in terms of that uh, that's linear right which is good linear space complexity is a good thing we have unavoidable exponential time and this unavoidable exponential time is really bad because it makes our algorithm much more slower and inefficient. I think I guess this table summarizes for you, right? I guess for most of these algorithms, for DFS and backtracking, space-wise, we uh, we I believe we get linear. BFS we have exponential for space, but for all of them for time we have exponential time, and this is unavoidable when you implement backtracking DFS or BFS, right? And that's not good. We want to we do not want exponential time. So now we're going to talk about dynamic programming. And dynamic programming is how we avoid the exponential time. And it's a really innovative, cool technique to avoid exponential time. And don't worry if you're wondering, what's the connection to machine learning? I'll draw those connections towards the later second half of the video. So let's jump into dynamic programming. Um, if you're familiar with uh, competitive programming, or I guess um, algorithmic programming, you probably know what dynamic programming is in relation to that. I think it's very similar here. And I guess in this case, with like dynamic programming, it's really just a technique to make life easier for us when we do these graph computations, we run these graph search algorithms or tree search algorithms. And let's get into dynamic programming and why it's so useful in the case of avoiding this exponential time. So I guess the earlier question I brought up was, how do we avoid the exponential time involved with tree search algorithms? That's what we were talking about earlier. And that's the problem we want to solve right now. And the optimization technique that we're going to use for these graph problems is known as dynamic programming. And so dynamic programming uses a very cool technique to avoid this issue of exponential time with tree search algorithms like DFS and BFS. I think this is a really cool graphic of how uh, dynamic programming is going to work for the purposes of graphs. So let me explain this. So we have states in dynamic programming. Dynamic programming's uh, main concept here is this idea of state, right? We want to choose future actions optimally based on a summary of past actions. Uh, to make an example, back to our farmer, cabbage, goat, wolf problem, we want to look at our past summary of actions, or our past list of failed and positive actions, to make rational future decisions. So we know our state S has a cost SA associated with advancing to the next state S prime. And then we know there's a future cost involved, S prime, involved in reaching the end state. And a minimum cost path from state S to an end state at the most simple level spans this state S, state S prime, and then the end state, right? And so dynamic programming is really cool because it uses it uses the future cost as the main surveyor of how to optimally advance in these graphs. And that's why dynamic that's, that's what dynamic programming brings to the table. It finds the minimum cost path by also considering the future cost. And this is how we optimize graph problems and avoid this exponential time issue. So here we go. Dynamic programming, the central idea here is that we're only going to do our minimum cost path computations only once. Um, I think an example is that we only keep one city. So let me talk about this example. Um, so I haven't really discussed the idea of um, graphs as a practical algorithm, but let me talk about it now. So let's just say we're in the Bay Area and we want to find a certain, a most optimal route from San Francisco International Airport to San Jose International Airport. And we want to find the most optimal route in terms of time. Time is our cost in this case. There's so many different ways to get there, but there's definitely a most optimal way. Right? So I guess the way we would the way you did trial and error for this, assuming you don't have access to Google Maps and all these uh, and you have zero prior knowledge of the Bay Area and the Bay Area highway and roads her road structures and maps, is that you'd basically just uh, try different cities, try different uh, highways, different roads until you find some way to reach this minimum cost path, or in the case of this problem, the minimum time path to the airport from to, between the two airports. And I guess this idea is that you go across a bunch of different landmarks between the two airports, 
or different places where you can consider nodes, right? The different roads, different major highways, like 101, 280, etc. These are our nodes in this problem. The different roads to get there from one airport to another airport. And the idea is that in dynamic programming, we're not going to keep an entire list of all the roads and all the uh, outcomes that we've already covered, right? We're not going to keep a, ro a list of these multiple minimum costs like subtrees and subpaths, right? In dynamic programming, what's really interesting is that we only do these minimum cost computations only once and that we only keep on hand the last city with the most optimal future output. And the reason that we only keep the last city is that, or in this case, the last node, is that we know the future cost. I mean, that's the essence of dynamic programming. This the fact that we know this future cost as prime allows us to only keep our last node instead of keeping an entire list of nodes and list of subtrees. So that's the essence of dynamic programming, and that's how it makes our algorithm more efficient. Because in end, the idea is that it reduces the repeated structures in our algorithm. And this is amazing because this is exponential saving in both time and space. So that's why dynamic programming is really crucial in this idea of graph problems for the purposes of machine learning. Um, this is, I'm not going to go too deep into the implementation of dynamic programming because this is the end of the day. This is a machine learning course or a machine learning series, right? We're not, the goal of everything is to understand all of this for the purposes of machine learning. And so we're not going to talk about this in extreme detail, but um, I think this is interesting in that you can, the idea of dynamic programming is that we collapse all the past tree nodes into what's known as directed acyclic graph. Um, the assumption behind dynamic programming is that the state graph of actions and states are, are acyclic. So let me just break this down quickly. Um, so our state graph of actions and states being acyclic means that there's no path from start to finish, from start back to the start for both of these graphs. In other words, in the an example of going between the two barrier airports, we're not, there's no way to reach one node again back from the nodes a different time. So, so I guess let me give a more practical, more uh, concrete example. So San Jose International Airport and the San Francisco International Airport are both about, is about, uh, I believe, 30 miles away from each other. 20, actually, yeah, 20 miles away from each other. So for these airports, I guess 280 is, a one, is one of the ways to get there. It's a highway, Interstate 280. And what I mean is that let's just say you cross 280 once. It's one of your nodes, right? You take 280. It's one of your nodes on the graph, right? So in that case, 280 it's acyclic. So what I mean by acyclic is that, let's just say we took 280 once and we took a road off of 280, we can't return to 280, right? You can't go from back from start to finish to back to start. So it's not a cycle in this case. And so that's an assumption for dynamic programming. That's how we keep our list of nodes. And what I mean by state here, I think I brought up the term state a lot, but in this case, state is the summary of past actions to make the optimal future pick. And going back to the essence of dynamic programming, the most, the most, the crucial, this crucial um, layout of how it works, state is what we keep constantly update based on our cost and future cost, and that's the the main idea in dynamic programming. And there's the algorithm, if just in case you wanted to look into that. So here's a summary of dynamic programming. So dynamic programming is can really just be summarized as backtracking search with memoization. And memo by memoization, that's the crucial part here, right? The memoization allows us, instead of keeping an entire list of the past paths and uh, edges, nodes, and subtrees, we're only keeping a, a one pass node on our on hand. In other words, we're only doing our minimum cost path computations only once. And this is exponentially saving in both time and space. And more crucially, saves us from that dreaded exponential time involved in tree search algorithms like depth first search and breadth first search. And that's dynamic programming, right? And so there we go. So it relies on this concept of the state and future cost and cost. And so let's move on to what we can do based on knowing dynamic programming and these tree search algorithms. So now I want to talk about uniform cost search. And uniform cost search is another really interesting algorithm that can be used in conjunction with like other techniques like dynamic programming, BFS, DFS, in order to traverse a graph. And at the end of the lecture, I will explain the broad significance to machine learning. Uniform cost search is an example of an algorithm where you have a search algorithm with the ability to handle cycles. So I think um, we didn't go into too much into depth on this, but going back to dynamic programming, we assume that the graph for dynamic programming 
when we implement it, we assume that the graph is of actions and states is acyclic. In other words, we're assuming all of our edges and nodes do not form a cycle. Like you can't go back and can't go back in a cycle. That's the crucial assumption. Uniform cost search is a, a similar to dynamic programming, in that, but it has this crucial ability to handle cycles. It can handle um, acyclic graphs and cy cyclic graphs as well. So it can handle cyclic graphs alongside acyclic graphs. And the main idea of UCS, Uniform Cost Search, is that it enumerates states in order and terms of increasing past cost. I'm not going to dig too deep into this, into this um, algorithm, because I think I said it earlier, this is not an algorithmic programming course, this is a machine learning course. But Uniform Cost Search is a really cool way to handle cycles involved in a dynamic programming. Because I think I told you guys, right? Dynamic programming does have the drawback that we cannot run it without assuming that our graph is acyclic. But now, this UCS gives us the ability to handle cycles. And the actually impl actual implementation of UCS involves, we basically list all of our states and our past nodes in terms of increasing costs. So we basically list our nodes in terms of which ones have more cost. So back to the highway, um, the example of the two airports, San Jose and San Francisco, if you wanted to go between those two airports, all the nodes represent different roads, uh, landmarks, uh, highways, and the edges are the actual paths between those uh, roads and highways and whatever, then a uniform cost search on that on that graph will basically be saying that we're gonna we're gonna run through all of our nodes and states by which ones have increasing cost. So we're gonna run through all of our states by understanding which ones take more time, right? Because time is the cost in that example. And the assumption for running UCS is that all action costs are non-negative. They don't have to be the same. They don't have to be. They don't have to be the same, but they're not going to be zero, right? They're just non-negative. And in this case, um, the input itself is a search problem, right? So we have an expansive near-infinite graph. So what's the strategy for uniform cost search? So we have three types of nodes in uniform cost search. We have explored nodes, frontier nodes, and unexplored nodes. And these are the different um, types of nodes, right? So let me let's talk about each one. Explore nodes are nodes that we found the optimal path to, and we're pretty much satisfied with how we've done on those nodes. Frontier nodes are nodes we've seen, but we're still figuring out there how to get there cheaply. In other words, we're figuring out the most optimal or minimum cost path to that node. And unexplored nodes are nodes or states that we haven't seen at all. We've never visited this node. So that's the uniform cost search. Uh, this is, I'm not really going to spend too much time on this, but I think there is some people point out that uniform cost search is very similar to, for very famous graph algorithm known as Dijkstra's algorithm. And I guess that there's a small difference in these two, and it's that, I guess, uniform cost search will search from the shortest path from, in terms of cost, to a goal node, which, and goal node is really just the end node. So uniform cost search looks for the shortest path from cost to a goal, to the final node, but Dijkstra is, on the other hand, even though it's really similar in its behavior, it's going to search from the lowest, from the shortest path from the root node to every other node in the graph. So I think the difference here is that uh, UCS is going to look at the shortest cost to the goal node. Dijkstra looks to the shortest cost from root to every other node in the graph. Here's the implementation. I'm not going to really go over this because I think hopefully you understand that this is a machine learning series. And now we're going to talk about the, the connection to machine learning, right? Let's first understand the connection to comparison to dynamic programming. So we said that dynamic programming can handle negative cost, right? So we said, what was the assumption for dynamic programming? The assumption for dynamic programming was that it's just that the graph cannot be acyclic. We can handle everything else, right? Sorry, the graph cannot be cyclic, right? But the issue with dynamic programming is that even though we can handle negative cost, which is good, which is really nice, we're restricted to, ac we're just restricted to cyclic graphs. On the other side, uniform cost search is interesting because it's the complete opposite. It cannot handle uh, negative costs, right? The assumption here was that all costs are non-negative, but we can still perform search on eight on cyclic graphs. Sorry, that's a typo. We can still perform search on cyclic graphs. And uh, time complexity-wise, these two are very similar. And I want you to understand that's really just a push and pull. Um, for, it depends on which type of graph you want to use. And then based on that, you can implement either dynamic programming or uniform cost search. Both are really interesting graph algorithms, search algorithms. And now let's conclude this lecture. 
some of the takeaways from today is that we can really just move beyond classifiers to discuss action sequence algorithms, right? We can turn our problem into what's known as a graph, right? And a machine can look for the most efficient way to solve that graph in the most smooth way possible. Uh, we started off by discussing tree search, the idea of uh, basic like algorithms like uh, backtracking, recursive backtracking, DFS, BFS. Uh, we then talked about dynamic programming, how it avoids the exponential time involved in tree search. And we talked about the, the benefits of UCS and dynamic programming. Uh, uniform cost search is similar, but they both offer different benefits, right? And can, going back here, UCS cannot handle negative costs. Dynamic programming can handle negative costs, but dynamic programming is restricted to ASIC graphs. UCS can perform search on cyclic graphs. So it really depends on their problem, right? And I want to um, take a second here to really understand why to draw the connection to broad machine learning. And in machine learning, right, I think this is lecture is really interesting to me because I think the common person who starts a machine learning course doesn't really talk about algorithms as more than classifiers, right? I think if you right now we've already we've talked about support vector machines, logistic regression, um, k nearest neighbors. Uh, we're going to talk about k-means clustering next lecture with unsupervised learning. But so far, we've covered so many different types of classifiers. And I really want, to, I think, really think that today's uh, video prevents, presents something much more powerful than just classifiers. Because even though classifiers are really cool in that they do solve our an immediate problem, I think in the long run, these graph algorithms like backtracking, DFS, BFS, um, UCS, um, even A star search, something we didn't talk about today, um, this is really what is high, higher logic machine learning, right? Imagine if a computer, instead of just giving you like the optimal output, like let's going back to our classic, our favorite cat versus dog image classification example. Instead of a computer just telling you that okay, this image is a dog, imagine a computer being able to tell you that okay, this image is a dog, right? And this is how we were able to get there, and this is how we can apply that knowledge to future images. So there you go. This is really just an example of higher logic machine learning. Um, I do apologize if today's video was a little fast and that I didn't, I know this is a more, much more complex topic over what we usually cover, and I did a little, definitely did uh, go a little fast, but I think that today's video does prevent, present a lot of potential in the area of machine learning because people look at this and then say that, okay, this is just algor algorithms for traversing graphs. How does this connect to machine learning? But in reality, just, I think the idea of a machine um, being able to select the right algorithm and using the most efficient algorithm to traverse a, a certain problem is probably much more useful in the long run than just being able to classify between images or different categories, right? And I think today's video, um, you should definitely look more into these algorithms. I think there's lots of uh, cool stuff out there. Like I think uh, I didn't want to discuss the Bellman-Ford algorithm today because I wouldn't have time, but I think that's a really cool algorithm. I think you can look more into DFS, BFS, and these types of algorithms, right? Because I think today I did not spend as much time as I hoped to, but in the future you can look into those. And this is the really the basis of higher logic machine learning, right? So I think let's just go back all the way to the beginning of the lecture. And remember, we're moving beyond. So this is the machine learning scale, right? I think this image came from uh, Stanford's lecture. And you see, we start off what we've been learning up till this point, up till today's video, uh, the first eight videos of this machine learning series was all about reflex machine learning, right? Reflex machine learning being classifiers, uh, supposed low-level intelligence, just being able to perform feature extraction, um, understanding features, being able to learn from features, and then spitting some arbitrary output, or spitting the category. Um, and by reflex learning, I mean like, this is the most common example, I guess, predicting housing prices, predicting if an image is a cat or a dog, predicting the color of a fruit. These are the most common machine learning problems. And I guess the research, current research area that's the most popular is these search problems and state-based state, state -based machine learning. Because I think uh, this, is, this has more potential, right? It's higher level intelligence. And these types of, this types of machine learning uh, beyond reflex uh, algorithms is really interesting. And that's, why, that's where most of the research is going to today. Um, deep learning involves a lot of this kind of state-based state learning. And that uh, when we talk about reinforcement learning later, we're going to talk about Markov decision processes. Um, we're going to talk about acute learning and adversarial um, networks. And these are all examples of state-based learning, where we have some kind of state, some kind of action, 
some kind of environment and we're trying to maximize a certain a certain uh, criteria. Right, so there you go. That's the connection to machine learning. So if you felt that today's video was a little out of place, I just want to take a second to explain how this video actually is really important when you think of how machine learning will advance in the coming years in terms of its logic and in terms of how we're moving from reflex models, output-based models, to state and action-based models. And that will do it for today's video. So uh, thank you guys for watching. Um, make sure to hit a, drop a like and subscribe to the channel. Um, so the, ne the next video will be the last video in the machine learning series, and then we'll have 10 videos on deep learning. And so uh, make sure you drop a like and subscribe. Um, it was a great video. Uh, awesome to have you guys today. Uh, make sure you can do make sure you can you do more research into this topic because, like I said, there's a lot of stuff to learn here. And uh, thank you guys for watching. I'll see you guys next time, and goodbye.